So, as a military psychiatrist, you get to Hawaii. And so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about how that is structured and what we do as military psychiatrists and that sort of thing. Okay, so and the 10 year anniversary, that it's 10 years last month that I returned from my deployment to Iraq. Um, the conflict that I was in, the war that I was in, was Operation Iraqi Freedom. Anybody who was there? I know there's a couple of vets in here, yeah? People, yeah? Okay. Where were you? I was like a uh, fob hammer and a uh... Top Cleary, but L seven O eight OF five. Okay. Yeah, so I was two thousand nine I was at Camp Buka. Uh, Camp Buka was uh, they call them now detainee camps. They used to call them prisoner of war camps. So a lot of um, previous generations of military people know them as prisoner of wars. Do you know what prisoner of war is? For the kids? I know they don't say kids. What are what's a prisoner of war? Somebody what? Somebody Exactly. He said someone that the U.S. captures as an enemy. And that's exactly right. I guess when you get out, if you're a prisoner of war, when do you get released? After the war is over. Yeah. So that was an interesting situation because they had thousands and thousands of uh, detainees. But this war uh, was interesting in that there was not like a very clear end to it. Um, it's kind of, it seems like it's ended and started several times. But in 2009, that was a point at which they were trying to turn over the detainees to the Iraqis because they had, um, you know, when Saddam, Saddam fell. Does everybody know who Saddam Hussein is? Who is he? Huh? <laughs> hey, I see my residents in there. They probably know who he was. Anybody know him? You guys know, but not exactly. So he was a dictator in Iraq. Yes, he was a dictator. Uh, he was a very violent dictator, and he had when he invaded um, Kuwait, the United States several times invaded Iraq to keep. The idea, I guess, was to keep peace in the Middle East. Um, so when Saddam fell, so eventually Saddam was killed by U.S. forces, and he was a very powerful leader. And so when he was out of power, there was a power vacuum and people from all over the world who were interested in furthering the cause of, you know, as an American you would say terrorism. And so it was really chaos. A lot of people died. It was, a lot of people died when Saddam was in power, but also a lot of people died after he was not in power. And the country was really chaos. So the Americans came in and tried to help them organize a little bit. And after several years, they did. But they, then they had 27,000 detainees that they had to decide what to do with. So as the government reformed in Iraq, the, the, we, um, the Americans processed the evidence and they turned over bit by bit all these detainees to the, um, to the Iraqi government. And they built, at the same time they were building them another prison. This place where I was, Camp Buka, it was a it was a bunch of tents, trailers with um, concertina wire and big fences around. It wasn't a permanent facility. So they, were, they transferred them over, um, and, but at the peak there was 27,000. By the time I got there, there was only 10,000. So we had on our camp, there was 10,000 soldiers and 10,000 detainees. Um, and we don't know. Some of the detainees probably got let go because they didn't have enough evidence, but then some of them went to uh, prison under the Iraqi government. So what happened, who provides the health care if you take a prisoner of war? Yes, if you take the prisoner, you have to provide the health care. And um, in the United States, we consider psychiatric care to be one of the primary specialties. Like if you come to medical school, and really it's like this at every medical school in the world these days, if you go to medical school you do six main rotations. Do you know what they are? I'll give you a hint. One of them is psychiatry. <laughs> but what else? Peds. Peds. Yeah. Surgery. Cardio. Huh? Uh, well, you do um, medical surgery. You do in internal medicine. Okay. Family medicine. OBGYN. Okay. So there you go. So those are considered the specialties that everybody in medical school has to rotate through. And then during your fourth year, most people do. Most people have to do also an emergency medicine rotation and a neurology rotation. But during a third year of medical school, you get exposed to all six of those specialties. And so, um, 
So when the Army deploys um, a hospital, they call it a combat support. There's two kinds of units that will have psychiatrists in them. One of them is called a combat support hospital, and the other one is called a combat stress control unit. I was with a cash, a combat support hospital. I was with 115. Um, we, they were out of Fort Polk, but really what a hospital does in the Army, they don't have a whole entire hospital of people back home. They have a commander, they have a few enlisted people that maintain the equipment, uh, but when they get deployed, that's when they get all their doctors and nurses and medics, and, and then also psych techs. So psych tech is a very important part of military psychiatrists, psychiatry. Uh, they, they are the equivalent of a medic um, would be for a medical situation. So in our clinic, we had Two psych techs, one psychologist, one social worker, and one psychiatrist. We also teamed up with the, uh, the 1163rd Area Support Medical Company. Uh, so we were an active duty unit, but we also partnered with the National Guard. Who knows what the National Guard is? Yes, what's the National Guard? You've heard of it, you don't know exactly what it is. Anybody know? Have an idea? So the National Guard. Are you guys taking uh, U.S. government right now? Okay, so there's this whole thing with states' rights and then the federal government. So the U.S. Army, the active duty portion, and the reserves are the federal government completely. The National Guard is divided by states, and they really belong to that state, but they also participate in wars, basically, and in a lot of other things. So if there's a huge disaster that the local authorities can't take care of, like Hurricane Katrina, something like that, they will deploy the National Guard inside the United States, but it's, it's rare. Usually you're deployed somewhere else. So they're kind of a state's contribution to military defense. Does that sound right? Who's it? Has any of y'all been in the National Guard? Any of the grown-ups? No? Okay. Maybe there. But I work with them. They're great people. Um, so we had 10,000 soldiers, and for those 10,000 soldiers, and at the time I was there, we only had 10,000 detainees, but it was at its peak, 27,000 detainees. Uh, and these are the specialties that we had. And you can see it's very similar to what I was talking about in terms of what are the medical specialties. So that's, and we have the Red Cross inspecting us all the time to see if we're offering proper medical care. Is, it, is anyone a Red Cross volunteer or know anything about the Red Cross? That's great, that's great. They're a great organization and they hold uh, people worldwide accountable uh, for the health care given to prisoners of war. That's, that's one of their important things. They, they perform many, many other um, helpful things for the military, but that is a very important one. So we had nurses, we had medics, we had one emergency medicine doctor, one internal medicine doctor, one family medicine doctor, one surgeon, uh, one psychiatrist, and then psych techs. Uh, one thing that was, we had, uh, so we only have one person of each type there. And so if a thing, a patient comes in and they are in your anywhere near your specialty, you have to take care of them. You have to figure out how to take care of them. So these this group of people I work with, you can see them right here, were very, very creative people. So once we had a so in the Middle East, um, there, you know, every culture has um, many interesting things about them. In the Middle East, one of the signs of being a traitor is that, or one thing that happens to traitors is they cut off your ear. So we, but of course these people are locked up, they don't have any weapons. Um, so one person was bragging that they were an, an informant for the American CIA. And so somebody else, one of the other prisoners, um, bit off his ear. He didn't have a weapon, so he bit it off. So then, um, so then, of course, we call the surgeon, right? We have only one, and we're hoping that she'll figure out how to do it. So she did. She went on, where do you guys learn to do things? Like, you guys as young people, where do you go to learn to watch a video on YouTube? To YouTube. She looked it up on YouTube. We had the internet. By 2009, we had the internet there. Interact. Um, she looked up on YouTube how you reattach an ear. Does anyone know about uh, what's special about the ear in terms of maybe sewing it on? Cartilage. It's all cartilage, right? And cartilage does not have very much what? Blood vessels. Blood supply. Hey, you guys are smart. You guys should definitely come to Texas Tech. Um, yeah, so it doesn't have much blood supply. Has anyone ever heard about reattaching an ear? 
No? You want to hear? Okay, all right, I'll take it. So you slice, you first you sew on the ear, just like you would any other piece that has been bitten off, I suppose. <laughs> um, and then you slice a hole, you slice a line in the scalp, and then the, you tuck the ear, the damaged ear, inside the scalp for several weeks until the healing has gotten to a certain point, and then you can pull the ear out again and then stitch up the scalp again. So the scalp has a lot of what? Blood supply. It has a very, very good blood supply. So you kind of, it's kind of fosters the ear to be able to heal itself. Because if you don't, any part of the body that doesn't have good blood supply is very difficult to heal if it's injured. So those are the kind of people I was deployed with, and they were fabulous. There's our commander, and we, so we had a female surgeon, female, we had a lot of females in the Army Medical Corps. There are not a lot of women in the Army in general. Many, many in the, in the medical corps, though. <coughs> and then the woman in the front row with the dark hair, she was our commander. She was, she was one of those people that could be very fashionable, even um, in uniform. She was impressive. Very strong leader. So, psychiatric disorders during deployment. So most people think that during a deployment, what you're dealing with is PTSD. And it's actually not really the case. When you're in theater, when I say in theater, that means you're deployed to a war situation. So when you're in theater, these are the things that we see the most. Family problems. Um, can, you, can you guys think of a way that would be, let's say you're a soldier, you're deployed to a war, um, and you have access to social media, what kind of family problems might you see? Yes, you miss a lot of milestones with your children. Give your That is the biggest problem. <laughs> that is the biggest problem. And you know, it's it's kind of funny when we're talking about it this way, but oh my gosh. These people we become really, really, really devastated over this. And you know, you, they're, they're stuck, right? They're thousands of miles away. They can't go home. And and so this is most of the things that you will see in a in a deployment situation from a psychiatrist. That the daily work of the psychiatrist. And actually, this was not only for the soldiers, this was also for the um, detainees. Because, you know, they're locked up, they don't know when they're going home, and they're homesick. They miss their mom if they were young enough to still live at home, and they miss their wife if they're older and um, were married. I remember one of the, one of the older men um, uh, wanted the family medicine doctor to marry him as his third wife. Yes. <laughs> it also goes both ways. Like what? What do you mean? Because as a soldier deployed in a in a cop, in like a small area, or even a major fob, when something happens bad to American soldiers, like say they get blown up in an IED and die, there's immediate blackout. So they cut off all the internet and all access to cell phones. Oh, you're talking about distress to the family. Yeah. So yes. now the soldier that's deployed. All the whole fob has no access to be able to contact anybody back in the states for anywhere from a day to a week. Yeah. Wow. So there's a yes. whole blackout for it's any kind hard. of outside contact. So that is another family distress. Yes, with that where the actual family is very is very very distressed, and there's and then of course the soldiers feel very um, distressed also because they. They want, they, they, want to, they want their family to know they're okay, and they can't. They shut down everything. Mm. They shut down everything. It's a very, very difficult situation. Um, one, one, kind of on that, talking about blackouts. So when I was deployed in 2009, so there's two kinds of units. There's uh, So Iraq had a couple of the combat stress control units I was telling you about. Those are just mental health units. They have psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, psych techs. Um, and... So there was actually a, a soldier who was very upset that he was getting sent home, and and he actually shot and killed five of the people in the combat stress control unit. So I was lucky because I was in a cache way far to the south. I was in southern Iraq, um, but that was that was a very it was very very horrible thing. That was very horrible. So, going back to Tom Lee. Tom Lee, this is what probably his, well, this is his, his painting that is most famous that has to do with the subject of PTSD, certainly. 
Um, and it's, the name of it is actually not the 2,000 yard stare, but people kept calling that so much, it, this painting that so much, that that's how it's known now, even though that's not what he originally named it. So, a little bit of the history. Who's read Gilgamesh? Do you guys read Gilgamesh? Okay, you know, it's so funny. I, I gave a similar talk a few days ago uh, at a, at a, a it was the War of the, no, Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg. And so it was an older audience, and they all read Gilgamesh. It was like part of the curriculum in high school when they were kids. But anyway, so I'll tell you a little bit about Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, it's one of the earliest surviving major works of literature. It was, it's called um, an epic poem, but it was, it's long like the Iliad, the Odyssey. It's like a book. And it's extremely old, 2100 BC. So this is the earliest recorded um, description, written description of PTSD. So Gilgamesh, he was a very powerful person, um, and the gods wanted to uh, interfere with his success, I guess. And so they they created Enkidu. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but they created Enkidu to be his mirror image to distract him from everything he was accomplishing. But then Enkidu, and so he became very close with them, and he described it, and like in words, in terms that an American would understand, it would be like a soulmate. They were very, very close. And a twin, but they, of course they didn't grow up together. It was that kind of idea. That's how close they were. But he witnessed his death. He died, and for the rest of his life, he was tormented by the trauma. And he, then, then the main part of the story um, goes on, the main part of the story is he is trying to be immortal because he's so horrified by his friend's death, and so he tries to be immortal. And, I, and uh, of course, he doesn't. But he does suffer from PTSD the rest of his life. Or symptoms that what we would call PTSD now. Um, here's an Indian epic poem, Ramayana. Anybody read that one? No. That, that audience over there, they didn't even read that. I was impressed. I haven't read these. I've read about them. Maybe I'll go, I'll go and read them now, maybe. Um, and there is, for the Gilgamesh, there is an American uh, wrote a translation of it in a novel form. So, if anyone is interested. So, Ramayana um, is an epic poem that uh, from India 2,500 years ago. He, the main character is nearly killed by an arrow, but then he has, again, symptoms that, that are, look like what we call modern day PTSD. And at the end, he became a meditating recluse. And I thought that was interesting, because one of my early patients when I was a resident, one of the first patients at the beginning of, uh, of the war in 2000, well, I started my residency in 2002, so I probably saw him in 2002, it was 2003. He, he had gotten medically retired, but that's just a temporary situation. They temporarily retire you if you have bad PTSD, and then they assess you later on to see if you're doing better and you can come back on active duty. So when I saw him as a follow-up, he had become a recluse. I don't know if he meditated much. I think he smoked lots of cigarettes. But um, yeah, he bought a cabin in the woods, and he never went anywhere. And so I heard that story many, many times over my time in the military. And that is one of the tragedies of war, is, is that people lose the ability to connect with their loved ones. Not everybody. Not everybody by any means. But it is a story that I've heard often. So then, going up to modern times, these are all physicians now that are um, describing symptoms that are like PTSD. Uh, despair, homelessness, sleeplessness, anxiety, these are all things that are kind of similar to PTSD. In the 1600s, it was called nostalgia. Of course, that's a different way to use that word than we use it now, um, because it was talking about uh, wartime uh, problems. After the Civil War, uh, Da Costa, he described a syndrome where he had pa heart palpitations, constricted breathing, and it became known as Soldier's Heart or Da Costa Syndrome. By World War I, they had coined the term, term shell shock because they thought it had to do with being in close pro proximity, not to death, but to an actual shell that was exploding. And that's kind of interesting because in this most recent set of wars, o uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, which was in 
Afghanistan, um, they, you start to hear about mild TBI. Has anyone heard about TBI? Who's heard about TBI? What's TBI? Traumatic brain injury. Yes, traumatic brain injury. So that, and, and it's called the mild tra traumatic brain injury, not because your symptoms are mild, but because your head hasn't cracked open, it's, an, it's all a closed head injury. So it's really a post-concussive syndrome, and it, a lot of people think that, it's hard to tell, like, where does the TBI start and stop, and where does the PTSD uh, begin, which you can imagine, because, my gosh, it's traumatic if you're that close that you would feel the shockwave of anything exploding, especially if you're in a war. Um, so, let's see, by World War II, Captain Charles Myers of the Royal Army, so he was a British doctor, um, started to talk about uh, battle fatigue, combat fatigue, and combat, stre combat stress reaction. So at this point, it was thought that the long, uh, the, the long extended length of the deployments during World War II, because I mean, it used to be, if we had a war, you got drafted or you volunteered, and you stayed till the end of the war, right? Um, it doesn't work exactly like that anymore, although it does for some people <laughs> if they <laughs> cooperate with that. But, uh, and so World War II, the United States was in that war for four years. So if you are unfortunate enough to get um, drafted at the very beginning, and you, but if you were lucky enough not to die, you might have been there for several years. <coughs> so that's why they have the term uh, fatigue. So this is a more modern piece of art from uh, the time period of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Wow. What is that white thing in there, you know? <coughs> it's a brain, exactly. It is a brain. And you know, I thought this was interesting because most people that uh, draw a picture of a brain, they make it gray. But if anyone's ever seen a real brain, it is, it is white. I don't know, it looks white most of the time. So this is actually a, um, you can't really see the anatomy of it, but at a first glance, it, it looks pretty much like a brain. And so there are chains all around it, and then there's a big padlock on it. And so this artist was depicting the chronic nature of PTSD, uh, the feeling that you can't get away from your symptoms, and um, from talking to many, many patients over the years, there are a lot of people who feel exactly like this, and they feel really tied down and chained down from this illness and these symptoms. DSM-5, who knows what the DSM-5 is? What's the DSM-5? Uh, it's the uh, criteria, it's the, uh, I just took one. I forget what it stands for. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Illness. And so the American Psychiatric Association. So 600 some It's big, test. yes, it's very big. And it basically lists all the symptoms of the disorders. And the way we diagnose these days, and it changes over the years depending on how much of the science, uh, the neuroscience we know, and we're knowing more and more all the time, learning more and more all the time. Uh, but basically, it's a list of symptoms, and if you have enough symptoms in particular areas, then you get diagnosed with that mental illness. Um, so, to be to, for the modern day uh, PTSD, we go by the DSM-5, and 5 refers to the most recent edition of the DSM-5, and um, it has different, it has several different criteria. And you have to have a certain amount in each category. And so the, the first category, the first criteria is that you, um, you have to have had some kind of traumatic experience. And it's interesting how um, people that, who, who are invested in helping their fellow soldiers can really affect the way that we even define illnesses. So PTSD didn't even come on board as a, as a diagnosis in the DSM-5 until 1980. And it was really the Vietnam vets that lobby to get this recognized as an illness and something that causes disability. Um, and then in this most recent set of wars, when I at the time that I was in the military, the um, this part changed. So you can see like direct exposure, that's what it used to be. Direct exposure or witnessing a trauma. But now they have expanded a little bit and talk about um, first responders or, or having a relative um, that has died. Because sometimes you will see that, especially in young children, um, if, they are, if they know that their parent died in a traumatic way or was injured in a traumatic way, they have exactly the same symptoms as somebody who saw their parent injured. So they expanded the definition. And a lot of this was due to um, 
people who either had PTSD or who were lobbying on behalf of their uh, fellow soldiers. <coughs> the second category is re-experiencing. Nightmares and flashbacks are usually the things that people uh, think of the most. A lot of times people just have intrusive memories. So they keep remembering these horrible things over and over again and it haunts them even during the day uh, while they're awake. That's probably the most common. And then a flashback is where you actually feel as if you're there. You feel, you smell things, you see things. It's a very intense experience and it's very hard to function if this is going on too much. And then the nightmares really, not only do they interrupt sleep, but they make people scared to go to sleep. C is avoidance. Um, this is something that sometimes you see avoidance and you see that what I was talking about, people becoming recluses. But there's also the opposite. Some people would come back and they would tell me, I feel miserable here, I feel horrible every day, I don't fit in anymore, and I want to go back. And so, uh, which of course was hard because if they're not functioning well at home, we don't want to make them worse by sending them back, but they really wanted to go back. And so you will see a lot of, or hear the stories of a lot of soldiers who have multiple deployments because they wanted to, because they felt they were so, um, they were in such a heightened state of awareness and alertness that the only place they really felt like they fit in is back in a war. Criterion D. These are some of the Criterion D, negative thoughts. These are very similar to depression. And this is a new part of PTSD diagnosis too. We used to just with depression and PTSD, but if we think it's secondary to the trauma, then we don't do an additional diagnosis anymore. If it's, these are the feelings that are, are causing the problems. Um, feeling isolated is one of the most, um, the saddest ones. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of patients come back and they, they, they feel guilty because they don't actively feel love for their family. They don't feel close to their family. And so, and so then it already it takes a soldier who's already feeling bad, and they start to feel worse over, over that. But that usually goes away if the family can support the person over time, then they are able to reintegrate into the family many, many times. These, these symptoms also cause problems. Um, irritability and aggression, feeling angry all the time. It's hard. It really is hard on families, and that's one of the that's one of the symptoms that if people have that a lot, they do like to go back to theater because they feel more comfortable there because they know they're not supposed to be screaming at their wife, but it's more acceptable to be screaming at you know some soldier who didn't do the right thing. This lower ranking, of course. Don't, don't <laughs> shout at, <laughs> at the higher ranking ones. Um, let's see. Startle reaction, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping. Unfortunately, difficulty sleeping is, uh, and the, so the first one, irritability, and the last one, difficulty sleeping, those kind of feed each other, off each other. If you can't sleep, you're more irritable. If you're more irritable, you can't sleep, and it just gets worse. Yeah, the symptoms have to last for one, more than one month. Um, symptoms have to create distress or functional impairment. And a lot of functional impairment for PTSD is not work. So a lot of soldiers that have PTSD do stay on active duty and they finish up their careers. But it might cause some impairment in their social life, in their family life, in their relationship with their loved ones. And then the last one, the symptom has, symptoms have to be due not or not due to a medication, a substance use, or a, another illness. So that's, you see that in every single uh, di psychiatric diagnosis. You have to be sure that it's associated with the trauma and not with some other problem. Because sometimes you'll see symptoms are very similar, but if they have a different cause, then it might be a different thing. In order to, um, so this is a reaction to the increasing suicide rate. Uh, that's been a problem since the beginning of Operation Iraqi and Enduring Freedom. The suicide rate of active duty and veterans has been um, increasing, unfortunately. So when I was deployed, no, this is when I was back at Fort Knox. So this is back at Fort Knox. Um, the commanding general decided that we were going to screen every single soldier uh, before we let them go home to their families. So this was an airplane hangar. They fly in. We set up in the <coughs> hangar. They get out on the runway, and, they, and the other hangar is where the families are. And so to get released, 
they had to convince one of us that they weren't going to kill themselves, or they weren't going to kill anybody else. So, guess what they all said? No. No, no of course they were going to say no. This was yeah. such a ridiculous idea, but it was the commanding general, so we all did it. And um, we did it as efficiently as we could. We did it really fast. And, you know, maybe one out of 3,000 soldiers would need to go to the hospital because they were falling apart. But usually it wasn't the ones that had family there. It was the ones whose family had fallen apart, or they just didn't have a family there at that site. You know, a lot of people join the military because they do have family problems. They have no real family. And so they look to the military as somewhere where they can have a close relationship with others in a more family-like way. And it works very well for a lot of people. Um, but sometimes it does backfire in situations like this. So we did one or two, maybe this whole time we were doing that. Um, yeah, and they call us at you know, 2 o'clock in the morning. And Army psychiatrists sometimes have to get up in the middle of the night. Veteran suicide. This is one of the most heartbreaking issues. Uh, from 2008 to 2017, there was at least 6,000 suicides every year. The rate, suicide rate for veterans is 1.5 times the rate for non-veterans. But it varies between men and women. Men commit suicide much more frequently uh, than women do. And everybody has a lot of theories on that, but it, that is how it's been true since the beginning of keeping statistics. And a lot of things start to, once, once things equalize in the workplace between women, men, uh, women and men, a lot of these things equalize too, but the suicide rate is not. Men are much more likely to commit suicide. But the difference between the female civilians and female veterans committing suicide uh, is more extreme than the difference between male civilians and male veterans. Mm. Again, lots of theories, but it's hard to say exactly why. So, one thing to know um, as budding medical people, suicide rates and most rates of most uh, illnesses and uh, any kind of problem in populations is per 100,000. So whenever you see a number like 5.2 and it's a rate, it's probably per 100,000 people. So some more uh, statistics. These statistics are all from the VA. The VA keeps very good records of everything they can. Um, 18 to 34, that's the age group and where we see this increase in the suicide rate. Um, very, very sad. Because people at the very beginning of their lives. People barely old, older than you all. Um, risk factors for suicide. So this, the, the VA has identified things that either make you more disposed or less disposed um, uh, to committing suicide. Um, social isolation. So social connection is the category, but it's actually lack of social, social connection that makes you more likely to commit suicide. Um, the suicide rates are highest among people who are divorced, widowed, or never married, and the lowest against, uh, amongst people who stay married. And this one, I don't know. It's elevated among <laughs> individuals uh, residing in rural areas, and um, but in urban areas, not as much. But again, they put it in the category of social connection. I guess uh, it's easier to be a hermit if you live in a, in a small town and miles from anybody. The more other illnesses you have, the more likely you are to commit suicide. Or if you have, and whether that's a physical illness or a um, mental health crisis. So the suicide rate for veterans aged 18 to 34 increased by 76% from 2005 to 2017. And this is, this is at the same time as the Army and the VA were putting in millions upon millions of dollars to try and create programs. So that's why we're looking to you guys as the next wave of medical professionals. you got to figure out a way to stop this. <laughs> uh, it's, but it's been a very <laughs> difficult problem, and we have not figured it out yet, unfortunately. And all the art that you see on the side, this is all Tommy's art, and Tom is very, um, very intense. So, so SUD, what does SUD stand for? Substance abuse. Yes, substance use disorders. That's a new term from the DSM-5, what we call substance abuse. We used to call substance abuse or substance dependence. Um, 
So it's mu you're much more likely if you have PTSD to use substances, but then it's also the other way around. If you use substances, you're more likely to have PTSD. You're soldier, better. And they smoke much, much more. Um, I know my residents that work in the hospital, they know uh, a lot of patients with uh, severe mental illness smoke a lot more than the general population, which of course gives them many more medical problems. Homelessness. In January 2017, HUD, so HUD is the Hous Housing and Urban Development. It's a federal, it's a part of the federal government and it tries to make sure people are not homeless. Um, but they estimate that in 2017 there were 40,000 people that were homeless, veterans that were homeless. And this is just the most heartbreaking, one of the most heartbreaking parts of this whole. Um, this is another piece of art. I don't know if I can really call it art because this this is speaking to the civilian part of war. Uh, this is a regular car um, that was hit by a, a suicide bomb. Uh, so that's what happens to a car if it's a bomb. So these things are very uh, all the all the explosive devices that they came up with during the last wars were very very intense. And this guy is a um, British soldier, uh, but of course the, the British Army is also there in Iraq. Um, and treatments. Who knows what the treatments are for PTSD? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes, so cognitive behavioral therapy, as long as it's associated with, um, as long as it's an exposure therapy and focused on the trauma itself, um, does help people recover from PTSD. Probably at least half of people can uh, do a good a treatment and not meet criteria for the disorder. Now, of course, that also means the other half um, still do. Um, and we can also use medications. Really, the only medications that have been proven in large trials to work are the, um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, the most famous of which is probably Prozac. Uh, there's many of them. Um, but again, still, after those treatments, more than half of people will still meet criteria for the diagnosis. It means they don't recover all the way. So this is a very complicated illness to treat, and it's, um, it's by no means if you go to a psychiatrist, you can get cured right away. So we actively need people to go into medical research in order to solve these problems. 